Porsche has patented a six-stroke engine. So for my viewers that are proficient at math, you'll realize that's two extra strokes versus a typical four-stroke engine. And what's exciting is that one of those extra strokes is a power stroke. So we now have two power strokes. How does it work? Well, Porsche spells it all out in the patent. And not to brag, but I read the whole thing. Yes, all 12 pages, half of which are pictures. Okay, so the easiest way to think about this engine is that we are combining a four-stroke and a two-stroke engine. So here we are looking at the six individual strokes of this engine. So we're just looking at one cylinder and what it does through each of the six strokes. So the first three strokes intake compression power just like a four-stroke engine. Then we switch over to our two-stroke engine. We've got compression power and then finally we end with a final exhaust stroke completing our initial four strokes, okay? So we've got the four stroke engine plus the two stroke engine making this six stroke engine. Now you're probably wondering if we only have one intake stroke, well then where do we get the air for the second power stroke? All right, so let's look at these six strokes in more detail. Now one of the critical differences we need to understand versus a typical four stroke engine is that with a four stroke engine, you have a high point that the piston reaches called top dead center, and then you have a low point that the piston reaches called bottom dead center. In this engine, we have two of both of those points. So we have two different top dead centers and we have two different bottom dead centers. So the piston can travel between these different regions. So let's look at now how it works out. So with our initial intake stroke, we're starting from the lower top dead center and we're pulling in that fresh air and fuel. Then it's coming down only to that first bottom dead center. So it's still blocking off this port that you can see here at the bottom. Then we come compress that air and fuel, we have our power stroke, which is compressing all the way to this upper top dead center. Power stroke begins, that piston goes all the way down to the second bottom dead center. Now, once the piston reaches that second bottom dead center, you now have fresh air that comes in from these ports on the side at the bottom of that piston. So that small difference in these two bottom dead centers is what enables that air to then come in. So you've got your exhaust valve opening up, allowing that exhaust to escape. You've got your fresh air, potentially fuel coming in as well, or you could have fuel injection. And then you compress that air and fuel for a second power stroke. Again, this is very similar to a two stroke engine. Have that second power stroke again, going all the way up to that first top dead center. Power stroke occurs. It goes down to that first bottom dead center. So not all the way to the bottom, not showing these ports. And then of course you push all of that exhaust gas out of the exhaust valve there. So a lot of the magic with this engine is that you're varying how much that piston travels up and down. So here we're just looking at a simple graph of our crank angle going from zero to 1080 degrees. In other words, three full rotations of that crankshaft versus how much our piston is traveling here in red. And so you can see there's two upper points that the piston reaches and then one top dead center two that it reaches. And then you have these two bottom dead center one points and then this further lower point here. And so it's during that super low point that we reveal these ports and then we have scavenging occur so we can have that air flow into the cylinder, push out those exhaust gases and then use that air and fuel mixture for an additional power stroke. And one thing that's important to realize here is that they're trying to keep the compression ratios the same. So you're going from this bottom dead center one all the way to your top and then you have these ports open so you're not compressing while those ports are open. So you're starting from this point right here, compressing all the way to the top there once again. So they're trying to make sure that these power strokes are fairly even in how much power they are applying. Now, before we dive any further, it's important to realize that patents are intentionally broad, right? So we don't know exactly how this engine is going to turn out unless one is actually developed. For example, the patent allows for this engine to be gasoline or diesel. There are many different fuel injection methods that are possible different scavenging methods, different number of ports, different cylinder counts. Though the patent does suggest that the cylinder count should be a multiple of three, but it could be an inline engine or a V or a W or horizontally opposed engines, which of course 
Porsche is famous for their boxer six cylinder, or perhaps they could use a smaller three cylinder as a potential option for the Cayman. So we don't know exactly what it will look like, but we can discuss what we know will be different about it versus today's four stroke production cars. So obviously six strokes versus four, and we've added a power stroke. One of the important things to realize here is that now our camshaft is going to rotate at one third of the crankshaft speed rather than one half of the crank speed uh, like you would have with a four stroke. Of course, because you have three full rotations of that crankshaft for one rotation, one actuation of each point here for these valves. Now an interesting point there is that for the exhaust cam in the patent drawing, they actually show two different lobes on it because that exhaust valve is going to open up during this stroke here and then during this stroke here in order to allow for those exhaust gases to escape. So a two lobe exhaust cam profile, kind of cool to see. And then finally, the big question here is how do you actually create these two different top dead centers and two different bottom dead centers. And that is done using what is called a hypocycloidal crank assembly. Okay, so within your crank assembly, you have an outer gear and rotating inside of that is an inner gear. As this inner gear rotates, you can see the center of this gear follows a circular motion. And this circular motion is what drives the crankshaft, just like you would have in any other piston cylinder engine. However, where this design differs is that the connecting rod attaches to another circle, which is offset from the inner gear's center. So while the crank's rotation is circular, where the connecting rod attaches is not. Because of the offset, the connecting rod follows what is called a hypocycloidal path. You can see this path has three peaks and three valleys each of which correspond with the piston being at its highest point for that stroke, or top dead center, or the piston's lowest point for that stroke, bottom dead center. And as you can see, the distances of these high and low points differ. Up top, there are two high points and one slightly lower high point. At the bottom, there are two low points and one even deeper low point. So this is how the piston is able to travel different vertical distances depending on which stroke it's on. Okay, so why why go to all this trouble? What's the point? Well, let's talk about advantages. So the most obvious advantage versus a four stroke engine is that we have more power, right? We have more power strokes. Turns out that's where power comes from. So let's look at 12 engine strokes for different styles of an engine and see how many power strokes do we have? Well, 12 engine strokes with a two stroke, 12 divided by two, that's six power strokes. 12 engine strokes with a four stroke engine, 12 divided by four, that gives us three power strokes, about half the power of a two stroke. Or 12 engine strokes with a six stroke engine, 12 divided by six is two, but we have two power strokes per cycle, two times two is four. So four versus three power strokes in 12 total strokes. In other words, about four thirds or a 33% power advantage over a four stroke engine. Now, that's not exactly accurate. So I found a study that was comparing two-stroke and four-stroke engines to see how much power does one make versus the other if you keep things similar like RPM and cylinder size. And so in that study, a two-stroke makes about 70% more power versus a four-stroke. And so if we look at that logic and say, okay, if we have one-third of a two-stroke and two-thirds of a four-stroke engine and we add that all up, that means realistically we have about a 23% power advantage versus a four stroke. So an exciting uh, application of that. Say you have the 911 GT3 with its 4.0 liter naturally aspirated boxer six cylinder making 500 horsepower. The same engine with all the same size, same RPM could potentially make 600 horsepower, another 100 horsepower in a naturally aspirated engine. And that's really cool because we're really at the limits of naturally aspirated, right? Like how do you get more air into it? You really can't. You get a little bit above atmospheric and that's it. That's your limiting factor. So this is enabling you to boost the power significantly in naturally aspirated applications and of course turbocharged applications. Now the patent also strongly suggests that a big part of why this six stroke engine should exist is to improve efficiency. Now it's interesting because when you look at the engine design itself, nothing about it inherently looks more efficient. So I struggle to see how they would have a significant bump in efficiency 
efficiency overall. That said, there are some methods of using this engine in which you could probably improve fuel economy. Two of those scenarios being downsizing the engine, right? If we make more power per liter, we can use a smaller engine and often that results in better fuel economy because you tend to have lower pumping losses. In addition, because this engine is making more power at a lower RPM, it means it doesn't need to rev as high. And so this is another potential way that you can improve fuel economy because what tends to happen if you look at RPM versus load, you want your engine to be at a fairly high load at a really low RPM to maximize fuel economy. That's where you get your best brake specific fuel consumption. And so as a result, if you make more power at a lower RPM, as this engine would, you can operate at that lower RPM, have better efficiency at that lower RPM, and thus get better fuel economy. Now, the patent isn't quick to point out disadvantages, but as I read through it, three things stood out to me as potential challenges. First and most obvious, of course, cost and complexity, right? We've got more moving parts. To me, this isn't a huge deal because combustion engines are already insanely complex, and the fact that they work at all and are reliable is truly impressive. Next is emissions. So emissions are notoriously challenging for two-stroke engines. One of the benefits with this style here is that we're not injecting oil in with the fuel to lubricate the cylinder walls like you do in a two-stroke engine. However, you do still have a lot of the elements of the two-stroke engine, so I think emissions are going to be challenging. However, the patent says the disadvantages of the two-stroke method can be eliminated through the clean and complete combustion of the fuel mixture. So all it took was clean combustion. Poof, not a problem anymore. So neat that they solved that. Now the third and final challenge is engine balance. Now I believe the reason why Porsche states the engine should have a cylinder count as a multiple of three is for balancing purposes. However, it is still impossible as far as I am aware to have an even firing interval with this engine. So let me elaborate. If you have a four stroke, four cylinder engine, you have 720 degrees of crankshaft rotation. You're going to fire four cylinders within those 720 degrees. 20 divided by 4 gives you 180. You fire every 180 degrees of crankshaft rotation. You have this very even, beautifully smooth firing interval. Now, one of the things with this engine is that your power stroke, your top dead centers here, is not actually directly aligned with 360 and 720 degrees of crank rotation because of this unique shape, right? So one is slightly to the left of 360, one is slightly to the right. So with that alone, and you can see this in the patent drawing, with that alone, you're not going to have an even firing interval. Okay, so for example, let's say we have a three cylinder engine. We have 1080 degrees of crank rotation and we need to have six power strokes occur because we have those three cylinders, right? So 1080 divided by six, that means we want to fire every 180 degrees of crank rotation. We already can't do that because of that slight offset, but that's not a huge deal. Let's try and plan out each of these three cylinders when they're going to fire, right? So let's look at our first cylinder. What we know with our six strokes here, we're going to fire on the third and the fifth strokes. So looking at our first cylinder here, we're gonna fire at three and we're going to fire at five, right? We're separated by about 360 degrees of rotation. So for our second cylinder, we can offset it and then we can choose to fire at a different time. So let's say there and there, right? It has to be offset by 360 degrees. So for our third cylinder, where do we put this? Well, if we start here, that means these two overlap. If we start here, then these two overlap. So there's no way of evenly splitting this out in order to have an even firing interval. So you can space them, but you're going to have some gaps in there between power strokes. What I think is really cool about this is it's going to sound very unique. So it probably will sound really cool. What I'm interested in is how they end up balancing this to make sure it's a fairly smooth engine. Regardless, all of this is a really clever solution that Porsche has come up with and it'll be neat to see if something does eventually end up in production. Now, just a quick comment here at the end of this video because this is my one thousandth video. So it's hard to believe uh, where this channel would have gone when I started this in 2011. So here we are nearly 14 years later and it is unreal the incredible opportunities I have gotten as a result of this channel. I appreciate so much all of you whether old or new to the channel that have watched. I really appreciate it. It is incredible what I get to do for a job. 
Thank you all so much for watching, and if you have any questions or comments, of course, feel free to leave them below.